アミーボー It seems like tradition that Nintendo find themselves surrounded by controversy when it comes to their various business practices over the years. For a company known for its brilliant games featuring family friendly characters like Pikachu and Super Mario, it's almost miraculous how little they understand their own fan base at times. And whether it's commercial failures like the Virtual Boy or the recent backlash brought about by the release of Super Mario 3D All Stars and the little effort seemingly put into what should have been an upgraded compilation, sometimes Nintendo can come across as tone deaf. If not downright sinister in their actions. But this is not a retrospective about headache inducing hardware or a limited time offering of emulations with low effort menus and box art. No, this is the story of how Nintendo, during one of its bleakest eras in the company's history, managed to chase a trend in gaming and strike gold while leaving many of their most ravenous consumers frustrated and confused by their tactics. How small pieces of plastic created lineups across the globe and caused consumers to lose their minds all in the name of completion, myself included. Today, we're going to go back in time to relive the madness and figure out whatever happened to Amiibo. Despite Toy to Life accessories being an available, albeit scarce, element in gaming since the late 1990s, The story of Amiibo really begins in 2011 with the birth of Skylanders. Originally sold as an immersive spin off of the popular Spyro franchise, by 2013, the Skylanders series had proved to be a universal success, with multiple games, a plethora of toys to collect, and over a billion dollars in sales. These figures would make any company reevaluate their approach towards the future of the marketplace. But among them all, Nintendo, having both the necessary infrastructure as well as a valuable catalog of characters at their disposal, We're in the unique position of having nothing to lose at this particular point in time. After the widespread audience who had purchased Wii and DS products failed to buy into their successors with the same level of enthusiasm, Nintendo was in the dead center of its roughest patch in years. Of course, given their industry dominance both in the 2000s as well as decades earlier, the corporate entity wasn't hurting for cash. However, with stock prices hitting record lows not seen since 2003 and their failure to properly market the Wii U to a wider audience, shareholders were likely apprehensive about Nintendo's place in an ever changing industry. And so, after originally failing to capitalize on the Toy to Life craze when Activision offered Nintendo exclusive rights to their Skylanders franchise back in 2011, as well as dabbling in the concept earlier with the Pokemon Rumble series, it was announced at a May 2014 investors meeting that the industry giant would finally go all in on the interactive figurine trend. And during their pre recorded presentation at E3 2014, while all eyes were on Super Smash Bros. and Zelda, Nintendo unveiled Amiibo for the first time to the public to. An admittedly lukewarm response. Some fans were, of course, thrilled that during the upcoming holiday season, they'd be able to finally add well crafted merchandise of Nintendo's most beloved and obscure characters to their collections. And with the ability to use them in game, in this case as figure player combatants in the upcoming Super Smash Bros. titles, Amiibo provided a functional reason for purchase as well. However, it was clear after the conference that other factions of the community were either against the idea of toys in gaming altogether or simply indifferent to the concept overall. Whether this tepid response was due to the child friendly association Toy to Life figures had at the time, thanks in large part to both Skylanders and Disney Infinity and their younger target demographic, or the fear that these seemingly harmless toys could become Nintendo's next step into DLC or exclusive in game content, it was clear that winning over longtime consumers would be more difficult than Nintendo had first assumed. However, despite a general lack of interest in online pre orders over the next few months, the first wave of the company's Toy to Life project would launch in late November 2014 alongside a brand new Smash title, and Amiibo would quickly become a bigger deal than consumers or even Nintendo themselves ever could have predicted. As the holidays neared and Super Smash Bros. for Wii U took over living rooms worldwide, there seemed to be an issue of scarcity plaguing the widespread community at large GameCube controller adapters. The Wii U offered dedicated Smash players its Pro Controller, but many fans were clamoring to use the more familiar GameCube hardware found across the series' previous installments. And they were willing to pay ridiculous prices to get it. Unlike their new Toy to Life figures, these adapters were impossible to keep in stock both online and in store, and a vocal portion of the Smash community was frustrated at Nintendo for mishandling demand of such a popular product. Meanwhile, Wave 1 Amiibo figures were beginning to sell. And within a week after their release, many retailers were completely sold out of less popular characters like Marth and Wii Fit Trainer. 
Though given the pathetically low supply most stores received, their sudden disappearance on shelves was no surprise. As a personal note, I actually remember going into Walmart on the morning of release, and as an employee at the time, convinced the electronics manager to check their shipments for any GameCube adapters they may have gotten. As I watched him open box after box, searching for the coveted accessory, but only finding Nintendo's brand new toy lineup instead, I couldn't help but notice that for every two or three packages filled with Pikachus and Donkey Kongs, there were only two or three figures in total for their less popular counterparts. And after our hunt proved futile, I proceeded to the checkout with a copy of Smash Wii U, as well as a bright new green Yoshi amiibo in hand. But as the days continued, I found myself wanting a few other characters I'd seen and despite having very little expendable income at the time, decided to go back and pick up one of the few villagers they'd had for my brother. Only, despite it having been a mere week, the store was now sold out of every one of these figures aside from Link, Mario, Donkey Kong, and Kirby. No worries, I thought. I'd remembered how little stock there was to begin with, and considering the store was fairly small, I figured I'd have better luck in my local Toys R Us. But no matter where I turned, there was no sign of villager anywhere in my region. And eventually, with no other options, I turned towards eBay in order to get the gift for my little brother. And despite paying nearly double, something I thought insane at the time, in only a matter of hours, things were about to get even crazier. It was reported that Nintendo would not be reissuing certain figures in their Amiibo catalog after all, stating to Wired, We will aim for certain Amiibo to always be available. These will be our most popular characters like Mario and Link. Due to shelf space constraints, other figures will likely not return to the market once they have sold through their initial shipment. And not long after this report was published, amiibo hunting evolved into a full-blown craze, with figures like the villager I had just purchased online now selling for four times more than their retail price on the aftermarket. Whether completely oblivious or expertly calculated, amiibo were now the hottest item Nintendo had on store shelves in years, and as Wave 2 approached, things would only become more difficult. With both Nintendo's poorly forecasted demand, as well as a recent shipping strike to blame for lack of product, the next offering of figures released in North America in December 2014 had barely enough supply to go around. This reality, of course, also led to a growing trend of new in-box owners. Consumers who, knowing full well the value, refused to unpackage and utilize the toys for their intended purpose. It also, like any limited item, created scalpers. Those who had no interest in toys or collectibles, but only the gross profits that a $12 figure could net them on third-party websites thanks to Nintendo's woefully low supply. It was also during this period that popular Wave 1 characters like Fox and Samus also began to disappear from shelves with no available restock in sight, leading to even more anxiety regarding the product's future. But as the new year approached and fans feverishly refreshed online for any news regarding the next wave of figures, Nintendo was about to add gasoline to a powder keg that was ready to explode. Making Best Buy, GameStop, Toys R Us, and Target the sole distributors of Meta Knight, Shulk, Lucario, and Rosalina respectively likely made sense to Nintendo as a way of strengthening their corporate relationships with brick-and-mortar retailers. However, to tired fans who'd managed to snap up the previous waves in one fell swoop, Nintendo's new diversification strategy meant that they'd have to be more vigilant than ever if they wanted to obtain them all. However, it was after Wave 3 that Nintendo's experiment in supply and demand was about to reach its boiling point. Before February's chaotic release, most of the figures had been easily accessible online months before they launched in stores, leaving the diehard fans, the ones who'd opted into Nintendo's Toy to Life experiment from the get-go, laughing at those who'd been on the fence to scramble and call stores tirelessly. But now, seeing how things had rolled out with the third wave, it became crystal clear. This was about to become a battle royale between those who wanted to use the product for their in-game functionality, those who enjoyed collecting official Nintendo merchandise, and everyone and their mothers who'd realized that with a bit of effort, they could scalp the elusive items for massive paydays, all competing against one another over the chance to purchase $12 plastic toys. And Nintendo, being typically cagey with information, were reaping the rewards. The widespread effect of amiibo scarcity was propelling consumers to buy those that were still available on impulse alone. And Despite their initial reluctancy, it was clear that the Toy to Life gamble was a massive success, selling twice as many units as Super Smash Bros. for Wii U, and helping to bolster the company's bottom line overall during the first sales period post-release. But despite these numbers, Nintendo still had zero interest in reissuing older figures, at least never stating so publicly. And with Wave 4 quickly approaching, things were about to reach a critical mass of hysteria not seen since the days of the Wii. It all began in North America on April 3rd, when NES, GameStop's next exclusive, released onto its online storefront for pre-orders. 
and subsequently crashed the entire website. This was a warning call to every gamer, collector, and scalper that playtime was over. And with two other exclusives still yet to come, fans weren't taking any more chances, with many going to their local game stores immediately to pre-order the entire new crop of toys before they became unavailable for good. However, by far the biggest concern in the wave, like many of the Fire Emblem figures before them, were Robin and Lucina, two characters that it seemed Nintendo had little faith in, but had recently become popular entities thanks to their appearance in Fire Emblem Awakening on the 3DS. This paradoxical decision by Nintendo proved to be the toughest on amiibo aficionados, and many who went into retailers looking to complete the set were swiftly informed that the two Awakening reps had sold out long ago, with many stores only receiving two or three figures total. Luckily for fans, there seemed to be plenty of other, more popular characters like Charizard and Wario to go around. But when it came to the two sword wielders, it appeared as though supply wasn't even close to fulfilling the growing demand. And so with gamers and journalists alike ranting about the absurd reality that now permeated Nintendo's latest fad, many found themselves lined up outside various stores across North America on May 25th, 2015, in the hopes that perhaps there was more stock after all. Sadly, there wasn't. It was another Nintendo-produced nightmare, and along with a special Golden Mario released a few months prior, it felt like at this point, over half of the Smash figures were now going for at least three times their retail price post-launch, and destroying many collectors' dreams of completing their growing roster one wave at a time. This was the absolute apex of Amiibo Madness, and it was at this point that many fans simply gave up and either decided to import figures from other regions like Japan, where stock seemed much more plentiful, or threw in the proverbial towel, waiting for the day when Nintendo would figure things out and announce a restock. And then, they did. Sort of. It didn't happen overnight, but slowly over time, older figures that had been impossible to find for a reasonable price began to pop up in stores once again. First, it was the Fire Emblem characters, to coincide with the release of Codename Steam, a 3DS game that featured exciting amiibo content tied specifically to the fictional sword fighters. Then Wii Fit Trainer, a remodeled villager, and even past retailer exclusives like Shulk and Ness started appearing everywhere again. Even Golden Mario, a toy made with the purpose of being collectible, showed up around various shops over the next few months. At the same time, Wave 5, bizarrely consisting of only Palutena and Dark Pit, was released in North America at Amazon and Best Buy respectively in a much more relaxed launch process. It wasn't as simple as acquiring figures from many of the other lines such as Super Mario Bros. and Splatoon, which dropped alongside the ever-popular Smash lineup throughout 2015. But along with Wave 6, which debuted in September with greater stock than any previous crop thus far, it was a cakewalk to find Amiibo in the latter portion of the year. Of course, there were still a few wrinkles. It was Nintendo after all, and the release of a Mega Yarn Yoshi alongside Wave 6 proved that they still believed in making some products harder to acquire. But at this point, even unique sets like the Retro Triple Pack featuring Duck Hunt Dog, Rob, and Mr. Game & Watch weren't just possible to purchase on the day of release, but available on store shelves for months after launch eventually with some shops even putting them on clearance, showing that Nintendo had almost certainly begun to increase supply to an almost ludicrous degree. By the end of the year, most people had stopped making note of the waves altogether. And with the Smash Bros. series nearing completion, consumers would simply purchase who they wanted, when they wanted, with no ticking clock to decide their purchasing patterns. The well-received addition of Player 2 variants for Bayonetta, Cloud, and Corrin prompted scalpers to make one last effort at hoarding figures. But for the most part, it was a Nintendo fan's paradise, with those who wanted to buy the toys to use them as, well, toys, finally able to do so without worry. And as 2015 came to a close, it seemed as though the amiibo craze that had overtaken the hearts and wallets of every Nintendo fan in North America had come to an unceremonious end. But of course, the story wasn't over yet. Over the course of the next few years, Nintendo would continue to push the envelope of what constituted an amiibo, with various other formats such as NFC-equipped cards and even cereal boxes replacing the plastic husks that had become familiar. However, whilst these oddities as well as the Smash lineup of figures would continue to be generally well-stocked even into its next iteration and roster, other sought-after amiibo weren't as easy to acquire. The repackaging of specific Nintendo icons like Kirby and Rosalina into other series ensured that their Smash Bros. counterparts wouldn't be receiving the same treatment as characters like Fox and Captain Falcon before them. And special offerings like Low in the Dark Boo and the Squid Sisters Double Pack can only be gotten today at ridiculous markups thanks to their limited nature and no sign of restock in sight. 
And then of course, there's the anniversary figurines, which of course on paper seems like a brilliant way of enshrining Nintendo history in collectible merchandise. However, in practice has resulted in specific iterations of Link becoming much too expensive for an average fan to pursue after their initial limited release. However, aside from recent announcements that Nintendo is in the process of reissuing various Animal Crossing amiibo cards that have become impossible to find during the success of New Horizons, as well as figures of Terry, Byleth, and Banjo-Kazooie coming out sometime next year to finish up Smash Ultimate's first wave of DLC characters, there's no denying that not only amiibo, but the toy to life craze in general has been slowing down in recent years. Yes, there's new Monster Hunter figurines on the horizon, and Nintendo's still very much in the toy business as Cat Mario and Cat Peach will drop alongside an enhanced port of Super Mario 3D World sometime in 2021. But there's no denying from even the most hardcore enthusiasts that things aren't like they once were, and I imagine many of them would agree that that's probably for the best. I feel like in retrospect, Nintendo honestly didn't foresee many of these figures selling the way they did, nor did they realize the sorts of profits that could be made off of products that people didn't even want to use. However, it's my opinion that following the first few weeks of Wave 1 sales, and seeing the demand growing in real time, the Big N knew what they'd created and purposefully played coy to drive up hype, which of course led to millions of dollars in sales. They could have been more open with consumers about which particular characters would get re-released, or, after seeing the response to the toys, could have opted to remake all of them with an emphasis on those that had little stock to begin with. But unfortunately for Nintendo fans, and despite Shigeru Miyamoto's insistence that they're both a games company and a toys company, the truth is that they are first and foremost a company, with no specification necessary. They have shareholders to appease, and manufacturing artificial demand and then cutting off all communication on the matter helped them generate sales of more than 39 million toys and 30 million amiibo cards during what was a historically tough period for the gaming giant. And they're still doing this sort of thing today. Not too long ago, Super Mario 3D All-Stars was released as a limited time compilation alongside a set of gorgeous enamel pins that honored the Italian plumber's 35th anniversary. And to the shock and dismay of many who purchased the game, Nintendo yet again had an egregiously low supply of the physical reward up for grabs, wherein online codes to claim the sought after set were only available to obtain digitally in the first hour that they were made public. And like clockwork, many of these pin sets immediately went up on eBay for more than 100 US dollars. And all of that for what was supposed to be a free reward, plus shipping and handling. My goal in sharing both this story as well as the story of Amiibo in its earliest days isn't to slander Nintendo, because let's face it, I'm a fan. I love their games, I love the wonderful communities they've built, and of course, I love their plastic collectible figures. But I'm doing this to shed a light on the dubious business practices that have plagued the releases since I can remember. And also, maybe to acknowledge that there might actually be a sense of fun and dumb accomplishment to be had from all of this. I'm not saying it's a perfect system, and obviously there are times when they've gone too far, but whether it's the NES Classic, one of their special edition consoles, or their absolute rarest amiibo figures, I can't help but enjoy the thrill of the hunt, and if I miss out on something, there will always be another special item a few months later that I know I'll want. Regardless though, whether you love it or hate it, this is reality for every Nintendo fan since they transformed from a Hanafuda card company into a gaming empire and it's clear that they're not going to change for anything or anyone anytime soon. And damn, if that doesn't make me love these stupid plastic toys just a little bit more. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed watching this one as much as I enjoyed making it. Next on the docket is an in-depth review of Super Mario 64, so make sure you drop a like, subscribe and ring that bell if you haven't done so already, and please leave a comment below telling me about your favorite amiibo memory or figure. As always, I want to give a special shout out to my amazing group of YouTube members for supporting the channel through a rough period, and I hope you all have an amazing month ahead. And as I always say, happy hunting baby rhinos, see you in the next one.